Attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webinar on understanding the facts about binge eating disorder, featuring special guest and presenter for today, Dr. Alan Kaplan. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. I would now like to introduce our guest presenter for today, Dr. Alan Kaplan. Kaplan. So uh, it's a pleasure to uh, uh, provide for you today an overview of binge eating disorder. Uh, and I look forward to uh, some interaction at the end when you may have some questions. So why don't we get started? Uh, so let's start really at, ba at a basic level. What, what is an eating disorder, a characteristic of an eating disorder? Uh, an eating disorder requires two primary uh, two primary characteristics. The first is the obvious ones. So you can't have an eating disorder unless you have disturbed eating behavior, and that can take many different forms. Uh, caloric restriction, uh, binge eating, starvation, purging, etc. But the one that really, the second characteristic that really differentiates uh, a number of those behaviors, because those behaviors occur on a continuum, right? Many people in the community uh, engage in those behaviors, it doesn't mean that they all have an eating disorder. What differentiates those who do is the presence of character characteristic psychopathology. So an eating disorder is a psychiatric illness uh, and uh, important to recognize it as such. Now what about obesity? So obesity has kind of always been out there. Uh, the American Psychiatric Association uh, publishes the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Eating Disorders every decade or so, uh, the DSM, and the latest iteration of that was put out two years ago. Uh, I had some peripheral involvement in that. Uh, and the question put to the uh, specialty committee on eating disorders was, should you include obesity? That was a question that the organizers asked. Should obesity be considered an eating disorder? And the consensus was that it's not an eating disorder uh, for two reasons. It primarily doesn't meet the criteria I've just described. The majority of people who are obese actually do not engage in the kind of disturbed eating behavior that I just described, nor are they more psychiatrically ill than a group of non-obese individuals. There is, however, a subgroup. Uh, it's about 30 percent of people who who are obese who do meet this definition. They do have disturbed eating behavior, mostly binge eating, and they do have characteristic psychopathology. And that is the group that we are now calling binge eating disorder. So it's obesity per se is really not an eating disorder other than this subgroup is best conceptualized as a complex, heterogeneous, multi-determined metabolic disturbance. So it's best to characterize the eating disorders, there's three uh, distinct entities that we now recognize on a continuum of weight or BMI. So anorexia nervosa, in order to have anorexia nervosa, one must be underweight and that's arbitrarily defined more or less by a BMI under 18.5. People with bulimia nervosa generally are normal or slightly overweight and people with binge eating disorder are almost always obese. Uh, uh, and in some cases morbidly obese. So it's a helpful way to view the three eating disorders. Uh, this line represents, uh, in my mind, uh, a question that I asked myself many, many years ago. I've been in the field of eating disorders for 35 years. And the question is, you know, teleologically, it doesn't make a lot of sense for somebody Somebody, somebody's brain to allow itself to starve itself to the point of emaciation and sometimes death. There's no inherent survival 
benefit in doing that, whereas you could explain binge eating across the continuum of weight as a natural reaction to caloric restriction or starvation. Our body objects to being starved, our brains object to being starved, and compensates by driving hunger and overeating. So that sort of makes sense, but it makes no sense uh, you know, physiologically that a brain would allow itself to uh, waste away, so to speak. And that led me to get interested in genetics. So that's what this represents. First the genetics of anorexia, and then genetics of both bulimia and binge eating disorder. And I'll say a few more words about that later on. So these are the DSM-5 criteria. Uh, and uh, they are recurrent episodes of binge eating, and binge eating is defined as eating in a discrete period of time, an amount of food that is definitely larger than most people would eat. So this is not, binge eating is not having a second piece of pie or, uh, you know, two or three extra cookies. It's eating an enormous amount of food and usually characterized as, uh, a, a, you know, a couple, at least 2,000 calories and eating that in a relatively short period of time. The second criteria is a sense of loss of control over eating. So there's a subjective sense that the individual has lost control. And this causes a, a considerable amount of distress for somebody who is engaging in this behavior. These episodes are associated with eating more rapidly, eating until uncomfortably feeling full, eating very large amounts of food even when they're not hungry, eating alone because of the stigma or shame associated with binge eating and feeling disgust with oneself and guilty after overeating. The third criteria is marked distress around the binge eating. I already alluded to that. And there's a frequency criteria in DSM-5 so that the binge eating has to occur at least once a week for three months. And that's interesting. Why is that important? Well, it's like cough. I mean, not everybody who coughs has pneumonia or lung cancer. So lots of people binge eat. If you do surveys across college campuses, you find a significant number of undergrad students will say, yeah, sure, I've binge eaten in my life. The frequency, however, is important because at a certain frequency, the psychopathology kicks in. And that has been determined through data that under once a week for three months, uh, there's you don't see the same kind of psychiatric disturbance that you do when you're binging above this threshold. And that's, that's the reason for the threshold. Criteria E is the most important one for you to understand, which is that the binge eating is not associated with inappropriate compensation. And that is what distinguishes bed binge eating disorder from bulimia nervosa, or certainly anorexia nervosa. People with bulimia always binge eat a subgroup of people with anorexia binge eat, but they always compensate. They get rid of the calories they've ingested, usually through purging behaviors, exercise, excessive exercise, or starvation. People with bed do not do that, and that's really important. And obviously, if you're binge eating at this frequency, uh, large amounts of cal calories, you are going to gain weight, and that is primarily what's, what's responsible for people with bed being overweight or obese. So keep that in mind because it's really important. So what's the epidemiology of binge eating disorder? So I've just got, described diagnostic issues. I'm going to talk about epidemiology, then move to etiology, and then end with treatment. So epidemiology of bed is interesting. It's, so it's more common than the other major eating disorders, AN or BN. The lifetime prevalence is about 3% among women and about 2% among men in the United States, and similarly in Europe. And interestingly, so with bulimia nervosa and anorexia nervosa, there's a great preponderance of, of women, about 90 to 95 percent female. It's much less so with bed. So we see many more men with bed than we do men with anorexia or with bulimia. So this is an interesting graph, and let me take you through this. This, this relates to the age of onset of anorexia, bulimia, or binge eating disorder, and in fact, any binge eating. This is obviously age in years. The red is anorexia nervosa. So what you see is that the age of onset of anorexia after the age of 20 or 25 is very rare to develop anorexia nervosa after your mid-20s. The same thing for bulimia. So these are disorders whose age of onset is in late adolescence or early 20s. The green purple is binge eating, and you can see it's quite different. 
different. That people continue to develop binge eating disorder throughout their 30s and even into their 40s. Quite a different picture uh, in terms of the epidemiology of bed versus anorexia or bulimia. Comorbidity is the other distinct aspect of bed. So it's, it's the rule rather than the exception. So the obvious comorbid condition is obesity and close to 90% of people with binge eating disorder are obese and interestingly when you look at studies of obese individuals having binge eating disorder and being obese is associated with a lower quality of life than being obese without bed. Mood disorders, affective disorders are very common close to 70% anxiety similarly around 40% substance use about 12% and interestingly and importantly and I'll get back to this when we talk about treatment about 30% of people with binge eating disorder will have comorbid ADHD uh, and it makes one think that there's something in common in the neurobiology of binge eating disorder and ADHD and I, it has implications for treatment and as I say I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. So what's the clinical current experience in North America and I would think your experience is consistent with what I'm going to say now. Uh, so most individuals with bed actually don't even realize they have an eating disorder. What disturbs people with bed is their obesity and that's what drives them to seek help. They don't even understand that the binge eating is necessarily abnormal. They're distressed by it, but they don't realize that they have a syndrome a disorder and that there may be treatment for it. As a result, people with bed rarely seek treatment from eating disorder clinics or programs. I ran the Toronto General Hospital eating disorder program for you know, a good 15 years and we would rarely get people with binge eating disorder seeking help. So where do they go? When they seek help it's usually for obesity and it's usually for weight loss. So they attend weight loss clinics and they also populate bariatric surgery clinics uh, and, or they seek help for their comorbidity. And that bariatric surgery population is important because one needs to screen those people out before the surgery as you can imagine, if, you're, if you have bed and you undergo bypass surgery, the post-operative course is much more complicated if you're binge eating uh, after your bariatric surgery. You, you can even risk uh, uh, you know, uh, tearing the anastomosis, the surgical anastomosis, and that's a medical emergency. So we as professionals at this stage in our understanding of binge eating disorder have a public health duty, an important responsibility to educate the public and primary care providers about bed. So I do a lot of that and I would assume each of you is in, a, is in a position where you could do the same. So how do we understand what causes eating disorders in general and bed in particular? So if I asked you what causes cancer or what causes heart disease, you'd be hard pressed to come up with one cause and, and that is the point. There isn't one cause of any illness, really, it, even an infectious illness. Uh, you could all be infected as a group with a virus, but not everyone's going to fall ill to that virus. Uh, and what determines whether you fall ill are other factors. So if we understand it from a biopsychosocial model, there are predisposing factors biologically that predispose people to eating disorders and specifically to binge eating disorder and they have primarily to do with genetics and genetics plays out clinically in people being obese and in uh, dysregulation of mood, mood instability. There are psychological factors. We know that the child who's going to go on to develop an eating disorder and binge eating disorder as an example struggle with issues of identity, with self-esteem, with being comfortably independent and obviously this is one of the reasons that eating disorders uh, tend to occur or first show uh, manifest it in adolescence when there's pressure to become more independent. And the same thing with sexuality. So people with eating disorders generally are very conflicted and uncomfortable with their sexuality. And as you may know, there are much higher rates of sexual abuse amongst childhood sexual abuse among adults who go on to develop an eating disorder. And that's true with binge eating disorder as well. And then there are cultural factors which often don't get paid much attention to in the family and in one's vocation and being exposed to the media. So how does that all play out? An individual is predisposed in childhood 
and what precipitates them falling ill in the context of premorbid obesity and mood instability for bed is puberty or some other in addition to some other psychological event that for people with bed who you know can be premorbidly obese that could be a bullying experience uh, being taunted or teased uh, that kind of thing and non-specific but for somebody who's sensitized and vulnerable it can trigger this cascade where they become increasingly dissatisfied with their body they start to try and calorically restrict and in binge eating disorder that quickly leads to binge eating which then feeds back to more restriction more body dissatisfaction and you get this vicious cycle and that's what we have to face as clinicians in trying to address treatment so let's go through each of these predisposing factors in some detail let's talk about genetics so there's a range of genetic influence that we're all vulnerable to there are those illnesses that are obviously completely genetic so if you have the gene for Huntington's chorea or cystic fibrosis you will get the illness cultural factors play no role in that and then there are completely environmental factors that have nothing to do with your genes so one's religious affiliation has nothing to do with genetics however most human characteristics and virtually all human illness are partially inherited and let's explain that in more detail so this is a catchy phrase genes or genes so the sources of family resemblance and differences have to do with the fact that family members share the same genes not all the same unless they're identical twins but significant number of genes and they share a shared environment they're exposed to the same environment growing up let's say children in the family however uh, there's a non-shared environment component where some of the children may be exposed to a particular noxious environment and others not and we'll talk more about that so these are the factors that contribute to the development of any psychiatric disorder and in this case binge eating disorder so what are the characteristics of partially inherited disorders they cluster in families so does binge eating disorder run in families yes it does but that doesn't tell us that whether it's genetic or environment right it could be due to the shared environment so the only way you can sort that out is by studying twins you study twins who are concordant, that is identical twins, monozygotic twins versus dizygotic twins. Dizygotic twins are essentially siblings who share 50% of their genes, monozygotic twins 100%. So if you can demonstrate that there's a higher concordance rate in identical twins versus non-identical twins, you've demonstrated a, a genetic risk for that illness and that's done in twin studies by calculating it's a mathematical model the additive effects of genes the shared environment effects some of the things I've already alluded to socioeconomic status par parent rearing religion and unique environmental effects so what's the an example of that for our population of patients so this would be an event experienced by one twin only for example uh, there are two identical twins. One of them goes out in an evening with their parents uh, to go to a movie. The other is left home with a male babysitter who proceeds, unfortunately, to sexually molest that twin. So that's a unique environmental traumatic effect that only one twin experiences and not the other. And that would put that twin at greater risk to develop an eating disorder down the road. So if you put this in a pie chart, interestingly, we know that the additive effects of genes to the etiology of eating disorders, binge eating disorders, between 50 and 60 percent. About 30 to 40 percent of the risk comes from unique events like I just described. But mathematically, very little contribution from shared environment. Right? And this is an important fact because in the past, we've been guilty as healthcare professionals in blaming parents for uh, aspects of their ch child's illness and certainly we see disturbances in relationships and families and parents but it, it's more often than not a result of having an ill kid as opposed to causing the illness that's important that doesn't mean that there aren't families where the parenting style or the family dynamic contribute but it, it's negligible statistically that's what this means so what do the twin studies mean 
50 to 60 percent of the variance in liability, that is the cause of bed is due to additive genetic factors, and the impact of shared environment is not substantial. So let's now talk about the psychological factors. So we know that people, uh, we talked about this already, people with eating disorders struggle with identity, self-esteem, autonomy, and sexuality. And let's talk about the cultural and sociologic input environment. So how do sociocultural factors play a role? The first is the family. So the family is the sociocultural environment that a child grows up, up in. The family can be protective of a child by providing a forgiving environment, or the family can magnify the cultural pressure for thinness and stigma against overweight and obesity. And you know, parents do that unknowingly often. Uh, and the important thing is to know your child's vulnerability. So I use this as an example to explain what I mean. So if, if you're a parent and there's a strong family history of alcoholism in your family, it would not be a good idea for you to be encouraging your child to become a bartender. That is an unforgiving environment for a child who's genetically at risk. It may be fine for a child who does not have that vulnerability, but it isn't for a child who does. And for eating this disorders, to translate that model, we need to be mindful of activities that focus unduly on weight and shape that can potentially further damage our children's self-esteem for those who are genetically vulnerable. And those include gymnastics, ballet, modeling, etc. The media plays an important role and unfortunately a negative one. So the media tends to glorify eating disorders among actors and others in the public eye it disseminates a ton of misinformation about eating disorders uh, and the fashion industry in particular misrepresents body shapes and sizes through photoshopping. These are not real people that appear in fashion magazines and unfortunately our children, our daughters and our sons are looking at these magazines and trying to emulate these body shapes and sizes when they're not realistic. They're not real people. And there are actually now countries that have made it illegal for the fashion for models to be under a BMI of 18. So Great Britain, Israel uh, have laws. It's a criminal offense for a modeling agency to have a model who is underweight to that extent. And that's an advance in this area, but we have more to go in this regard. So this is uh, you know, an interesting slide because it shows you pictures of a bunch of Hollywood stars, quite those who are quite uh, public and famous, all of whom have admitted or publicly declared their eating disorder. So Jane Fonda wrote a biography. Chapter 5 in her biography is her struggle with bulimia, which she continues to have. Elton John has been eating disorder. He's talked about it. So has Oprah. Uh, I had an interesting experience. So in 1993, I was a visiting professor at UCLA in their eating disorder unit. And Michael Jackson was an inpatient. And I'm not revealing any confidence because this has been publicly disclosed. And he was about 90 pounds. This is right after Thriller came out. And interestingly and tragically, when he was given the propofol and died, it wasn't so much he was given an inappropriate dose. He was given an adult dose. But he was given a, a, a dose for an adult male who was 200 pounds, the normal weight when he was under 100 pounds. So that's often not revealed. Uh, and this cardiologist, I think, as many of you know, went to jail of that drug. So all of these people are in the public eye. They all have talked about having an eating disorder, and it influences certainly the young to think that this is associated with notoriety, having an eating disorder. So how do we tease out the genetic and environmental effects? So let's look at a model. Uh, again, not to pick on ballet, but for a vulnerable child, this could be a, a noxious environment. Uh, and we have one genotype, call it AABB, and we have another, small AABB. And what results? So for the non-genetically vulnerable, it could result in a prima ballerina, a highly successful ballet dancer. But for another, it could result in an anorexic or somebody with binge eating disorder. Right, so it's the interaction between gene and environment that determines what course one would take. And this is the take home message. You may have heard this phrase before, it's useful. So genes load the 
gun and the environment pulls the trigger. We are all walking around with loaded guns for lots of different illnesses, whether it be breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, heart disease, etc. What determines whether we actually get ill? And that has to do with the environment, right? So we can't do anything about our genes, but we can do a lot about our environment to make it a healthy environment so as to not trigger the, the, the genes and illness. So let's move to treatment. This is the last section of my talk. And let's talk first about drug treatment. So what are the goals of drug treatment if we were to have a drug for binge eating disorder? So obviously the target symptom would be to reduce binge eating and to be able to maintain abstinence from binge eating uh, while on the drug or even coming off the drug. It would be a very helpful thing if such a drug would treat the comorbid pathology, especially obesity. So, and in my experience, I've, I've dealt with binge eating disorder patients for a number of years. If you want a binge eating disorder individual to be happy with their treatment, you can't just help reduce the binge eating. They want to lose weight, right? And just reducing the binge eating does not always lead to weight loss. So if you were to have an effective drug, it would do both. That's really important to remember. And then a drug that treated the core disturbances in bed, which have to do with <coughs> affect regulation, self-esteem, and some degree of impulsivity. And obviously, such a drug would have to be tolerable to the patient and safe. So those are the parameters of a good drug, and let's see where we're at with that. So I summarized here, and it's a bit too much detail uh, for maybe what you need to know, but there are a number of randomized placebo-controlled trials of medication for binge eating disorder. At last count, when I looked, it was about six months ago, there are 26 of these trials. So what does this mean? It means the individual is randomized, uh, like flipping a coin, either to receive the drug or the placebo. In the best model is to have it double blind, so that means that neither the individual taking the drug or the clinician giving the drug knows what they're on. That's the way you can uh, you know, demonstratively prove that a drug is effective. So there are 26 placebo-controlled trials in the literature. There are three studies using tricyclic antidepressants. We don't use TCAs anymore for a whole bunch of reasons. It was moderately effective, 40% remission versus 22% for placebo, but it had no effect on weight. There are a lot of studies looking at selective serotonergic reuptake inhibitors. This is the group of drugs you're probably familiar with, whether it's fluoxetine, Prozac, Zoloft, uh, uh, citalopram, Luvox. I mean, there are a number, paroxetine or Paxil, there are a number of SSRIs on the market. A number of them have been studied. And overall, not particularly effective. So half of the studies show drug was better than placebo. Uh, and relatively small numbers of subjects overall. SNRIs are selective noradrenergic reuptake inhibitors, drugs such as cybutramine, atomoxetine, uh, uh, and a number of newer compounds. Three of the four drugs studied showed that the drug was more effective than placebo. Again, relatively small numbers in terms of combining five studies. And then there's a, a significant literature on anti-epileptics for the treatment of bed. And topiramate is the one that's been studied the most, three studies. And three of the five studies showed the drug was more effective and one was negative. Uh, and again, a larger number of subjects. The only drug that was associated with significant weight loss was topiramate. However, the problem with topiramate is that it's, it causes significant unpleasant side effects. Uh, paresthesias, electrical shock, a feeling of being electrically shocked, cognitive disorientation. So the maker of topiramate, which really uh, conducted a very well done study and had you know, very positive effects, withdrew any uh, application to get this approved because of the side effects. So it's not an easy drug to use. And then there's uh, uh, some studies that have looked at weight loss drugs, and again, most of the problem with the weight loss drugs that have been out there, they've been withdrawn from the market because of safety, so uh, they cause cardiac problems. The only one that's basically left is Orlistat, which is a kind of nasty drug to take. It interferes with fat absorption in feces uh, and causes incontinence, uh, and it's not 
it's not a practical drug to use for our patients. So where does that leave us? What's the current status, 2016, of drug treatment for binge eating disorder? So the good news is that there's currently one FDA-approved drug relatively recently last year, and that's Vyvanse, which is Liz Dexamphetamine. It was approved by the FDA in January of 2015 and has not yet been proved, approved in Canada, and I'll say more about that. Most of the randomized control trials are small samples, brief treatment, and there's no long-term follow-up. So we don't know what happens to these folks once we take them off the drug. Pooling all studies together, I looked at all of the studies together, about 45% of subjects who receive a drug achieve 100% remission. That's not bad. Uh, it still leaves the majority of people with symptoms. So again, uh, having a reduction in binge eating, you know, a little bit of binge eating often leads to a lot of binge eating. So you're really looking for remission. You're really looking for abstinence on a drug to really be effective. Importantly, mean weight loss was relatively small on drug versus placebo. SSRIs had almost no effect on weight loss. The antiepileptics that I mentioned, topiramate, did have an effect. And other than Vyvanse, the topiramate anticonvulsants are the most effective in reducing binge eating and inducing weight. It's limited by side effects. And obesity at this point, and the ones that did have some effect have been removed from the market. Importantly, there's no apparent advantage of adding drug to cognitive behavior therapy. So cognitive behavior therapy, and I'll say more about this in a minute, uh, is the treatment of choice for people with binge eating disorder. It's more accepted by patients. Uh, the problem is that it, in studies, and I'll show you this, uh, it does not lead to any significant weight loss. And just to emphasize, there are currently no published trials of maintenance therapy, which really is the acid test in treatment. You know, uh, if somebody is on a drug for two months and does well and then goes off the drug and relapses, that's not that helpful. And so we need to see what happens with people long term. So let's talk about why we would even think of a drug like Liz Dexamphetamine. So Vyvanse is a drug that was initially developed to treat ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Why would we think that such a drug would be helpful for binge eating disorder? Well, obesity, binge eating disorder, and ADHD have commonly co-occurred. I mentioned that already. And the symptoms of ADHD have been proposed to contribute to the disinhibited eating eating characterized by binge eating and weight gain. Bed in ADHD are logically by dopamine deficiency and what we call a heightened reward sensitivity. Reward deficiency syndrome is what it's termed. So there's deficient dopaminergic signaling in the brain. And actually, when one binge eats, one increases one's dopamine in the brain. So kind of you are what you eat holds true in this regard. And so we know that people with ADHD have also low dopamine. So one of the theories is that they share a neurobiology, and we know psychostimulant meds, those meds used to treat ADHD, target dopamine and have been associated with increase in dopamine and increased behavioral regulation and decreased appetite and weight. So all of that gives us some rationale and evidence to try these uh, psychostimulants for binge eating disorder, and that's what's happened. So the biggest study that's been done, uh, and it's been done by the drug company, which is Shire, that makes Liz Dexamphetamine, uh, and this was published in 2015, and it's the study that led to the FDA approving a drug. And just to give you a little bit of the methodology, it was a large study, multi-centered, occurred across many centers in North America and Europe. It was randomized, double blind, and there was a forced dose. So you were put on 30 milligrams for a couple weeks, then increased to 50, and then increased to 70 as tolerated, uh, according to side effects. There were 30 sites, 255 subjects treated for 11 weeks. And it initially, uh, there was a three week period of titration where there were no meds given just to. Uh, uh, monitor people, make sure that they were actually binge eating, and then eight weeks of treatment. And importantly in this study, any comorbid condition was excluded. So that raises the question, uh, 
of whether the results of this study can be generalized to clinical practice. Because I'll tell you, uh, rarely do I see people with binge eating disorder and no comorbidity, no other comorbid psychiatric problems. So the drug company did that for a reason because they wanted to get a clear signal for binge eating and not contaminated by another psychiatric problem. So in other words, if there's a depression and you're giving them these drugs, one could argue that you're treating the depression and secondarily the binge eating goes down. So they dealt with that by just having a very pure sample, but it's not real world. And that's a problem with the results of this study. And they measured the change of binge eating through a number of psychological tests that were given. Uh, and these are the results. So the 50 milligram and 70 milligram group had a significantly rate, greater reduction in binge eating compared to 30 and placebo. And this shows you the abstinence rates, which were pretty quick at the end of four weeks. 50% on 70, 47% on, on, on 50, 35% on 30 milligrams, and quite a low response on placebo. And global improvement was clearly greater in the higher dose groups. And the number of serious adverse events were very, very small. Only 1.5% of participants had any kind of adverse event. And this is the same finding you get when you look at the literature on treatment of ADHD. So this study has been published, and I'm giving you the reference here, JAMA Psychiatry 2015, Volume 72, uh, 235 to 246, if you want to look it up. So we did our own study in Toronto, uh, actually even before the Shire study, and we chose to look at long-acting methylphenidate, that's Concerta, uh, compared to CBT. I, I chose to compare it to CBT because CBT is the treatment of choice. It's the one that had the most evidence. We wanted to see if adding medication added anything in terms of efficacy to an already established treatment. And so our hypothesis were that subjects who were randomized to receive the drug would demonstrate decreases in binge eating frequency and bad severity. Uh, that pretreatment ADHD symptom severity would actually be predict a better response to drug as opposed to CBT, and that pretreatment depression would be associated with a better response to CBT, which we know as effective in depression as compared to the psychostimulant, which doesn't really treat depression. So let's I'll show you what we found. Uh, participants were randomly assigned to receive CBT over 12 weeks or medication over 12 weeks. So I was the person prescribing the medication in this study. I saw all these subjects. And we start, I started with 18 milligrams at first, and I increased it slowly up to a max of 72 milligrams a day at week four. And this is the dose that's generally used to treat ADHD. Uh, and these are the measurements that we undertook for each subject. We measured ADHD symptoms. We obviously measured eating symptoms. We weighed people and got regular BMIs. We measured mood. We measured anxiety. And we had a measure of quality of life. And this is what we found. These are preliminary results, but they've held up in the uh, full sample. And quite remarkable. So if you look at BMI, people started at a weight of 221 pounds at week zero, BMI of 36. By six weeks, they were down to 209 pounds. And by the end of three months, they were down to 188 pounds. So there's quite significant weight loss in this group of patients. That made them extremely happy. Uh, and in fact, the group that were assigned to CBT, who did not lose any weight, the efficacy for binge eating was the same, but they had no significant weight loss, then asked to be put on Vyvanse, it was, uh, sorry, the Concerta. And I did that with a number of these folks, and it did lead to significant weight loss. And again, they were much more satisfied with that combination than with just the CBT. And you can see the binge frequency dramatically reduced. It was 19 binges a week when they started. It went down to 5.4 at week 6. And by the time the study was over, they were binging under three times a week. So a very significant effect on binge eating. So let's talk about psychological treatment, and then I'll wrap up. So this cognitive behavior model of eating disorders, as I've said, is the most effective treatment. And you can look at it as a pyramid where you first deal with the behavioral symptoms in binge eating disorder that's primarily with trying to restrict intake and binge eating, and also learning caloric restraint. Uh, 
And then you have to deal with concerns about weight and shape and the lack of dietary restraint. Interestingly, people with bad differ from people with bulimia. People with bulimia have high dietary restraint. They restrict their intake quite successfully until they can't do it anymore. And that leads to break breakthrough binging. And we know the binging in bulimia fuels the restraint fuels the binging. So the treatment, the CBT treatment of bulimia is quite different in that you try to lower dietary restraint in people with bulimia, whereas in people with bed, they can't restrain their eating. If there's food there, they're likely to overeat. So you almost have to teach them how to restrict in a healthy way. So quite a different approach, quite a different model. And then for all of these folks, people with bed as well as bulimia, they have significant deficits, as I've already mentioned, to self-concept and self-image, and that requires psychological treatment. So you can divide up the CBT into three phases. The first focuses on normalizing eating, self-monitoring of food intake, self-monitoring of thoughts and feelings, and specific interventions that are designed to normalize eating behavior, including learning greater dietary restraint. And that's through a number of methods. There, there are manuals that are published. They're in the public domain on CBT for binge eating disorder. Easily accessible. Just Google it, and you will, uh, you will be able to download uh, actual treatment manuals that go through this in great detail. Phase two of the treatment focuses on cognitive dysfunction, dysfunctional thinking, and restructuring thinking directed at dysfunctional thoughts that are related the development and maintenance of the eating disorder. And phase three is on relapse prevention. So once you get people asymptomatic, you need to keep them well. And this is the advantage of CBT, because you're teaching people how to keep themselves well through psychological intervention uh, without having the need, need to take a drug. And, and uh, that's an advantage of CBT. Again, the downside of CBT, firstly and importantly, it's not associated with significant weight loss. And secondly, there aren't a lot of people out there who have the expertise to deliver this. So when you're dealing with real life situations in treatment facilities across the country, North America for sure, uh, especially if you're a family doctor in an isolated area, what you have to offer is basically a medication. Uh, rather than being able to offer CBT. I would encourage all of you to get trained up on CBT for bed if you don't have the training. And there are a number of training programs that are available. The Academy for Eating Disorders offers training in CBT, uh, as do other organizations. It's a really important and useful tool to have in your toolbox. So how do psychological treatments do? They do quite well. So remission rates for CBT range from 55 to up to 80 percent, much better than drugs. And at one year follow-up, uh, a significant percentage of, stu of people remain well. Uh, and that's a very promising finding. IPT has also been studied in a personal psychotherapy for binge eating disorder. And again, it does reasonably well as well. And it's very acceptable to patients. Dialectic behavior therapy, another form of psychotherapy which is harder to deliver and more long term, has good outcomes though. Up to 80% of people are well. And there's even self-help, some of which has been delivered online <coughs> with significant remission rates uh, for binge eating disorder. But there are high dropout rates in the self-help programs. Just engaging in a behavioral weight loss program is not recommended. There's no evidence that going to Weight Watchers or Jenny Craig or any of the standard weight loss programs is going to have significant impact on binge eating. Once again, I'm emphasizing there are no significant weight loss demonstrated from psychological treatments, which remains a difficulty and a problem. So I'm done. Uh, I hope that was a quick journey through binge eating disorder, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaplan, for your excellent presentation. We are now going to be answering questions submitted during today's presentation. And as a reminder, you can still submit any questions you might have through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. So Dr. Kaplan, our first question from one of our attendees is asking, is a history of calorie restriction usually correlated with most diagnosed BED cases? Uh, with 
significant number. I'm not sure you could say most. It is associated with most cases of bulimia nervosa. And it gets back to the uh, differentiation I made a few minutes ago. That people with bulimia nervosa have a history of significant caloric restriction and at some point they lose control and overeat. People with binge eating disorder less so. Uh, and their difficulty is that they uh, have a great deal of difficulty controlling their eating when there's food available. They're more externally focused and so kind of the worst thing you could do for a patient with binge eating disorder is present them with a buffet or an all-you-can-eat option. Uh, that would overwhelm their ability to restrain eating and they, they would definitely lose control. That isn't so in the cases of people with bulimia who have that capacity. And that does have something to do with the neurobiology uh, people with bulimia are more seem to have more serotonergic dysfunction. People with with bed have more dopaminergic dysfunction. So they, how does that translate clinically? The binging and the result of the binging outside of the loss of control is somewhat pleasurable for people with binge eating disorder. I've had patients who plan their binge, they set the table for themselves, they go out and buy all kinds of gourmet food, and that's their evening activity. Patients with bulimia do not do that. Binging for people with bulimia is aversive and very disturbing. And so it's almost always much more impulsive and much more associated with uh, loss of control and and uh, 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 upset. Uh, so that differentiates the two. So the, in answer to the question, less so in people with bed, much more so in people with bulimia nervosa. Thank you, Dr. Kaplan. Our next question from our attendee um, is wondering, has there been a lot of research done in regards to the etiology of bed and other eating disorders? Or has the majority of effort been towards finding treatment? No, there's been a lot of research done. We've done a fair amount of research. I've spent really the last 15 years of my career with a large international consortium looking at genetics, which does have to do with etiology. We've identified genes now that contribute to the risk for anorexia nervosa, specific genes. We've identified genes contributing to the risk for bulimia. We're still a little bit in the infancy stage when it comes to binge eating disorder. But that is a very hot area, which is psychiatric genetics of eating disorders, which continues to be productive. Uh, the other area that is very productive is neuroimaging. So we now have the capacity to actually look at people's brains uh, and study what areas of their brains or function in their brains seems to be abnormal in people with eating disorders. So uh, we've, we're now in the middle of a large study looking at people with anorexia where we're imaging the, what's called the white matter. Uh, white matter shows up <clears throat> on an x-ray. Uh, it's the tracks of the brain equivalent to let's say your electrical wires. They have a, r a rubber covering which allows the electrical impulse to pass through uh, and the, the circuitry takes a message from the gray matter where the uh, neurons are to other areas of the brain. So interestingly, myelin, which is the cover, that's the white color, is virtually all fat. And when people lose weight, they lose myelin. So we're find, finding in our studies with anorexia that the circuitry is very disturbed. And not only is it disturbed when they're underweight, it remains disturbed. And we've seen disturbances in perfectly well siblings which su suggests that that could be a genetic manifestation of, of vulnerability to the illness. Uh, there are imaging studies that have been done in bulimia nervosa. Again, uh, BED has only recently come on the scene and less studies are published on that, but there certainly are some underway. Uh, so those are two examples of looking at the etiology of eating disorders from a biologic pers perspective, genetics and brain imaging. Thank you, Dr. Kaplan. That, that, you know, that aren't directly related to treatment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we have another attendee who's asking or saying, I work in an inpatient behavioral psych facility, and I see eating disorders in adolescent and adult population. From what I have read about eating disorders and mental health is that the depression 
or mental disorder has to be treated first before treating the eating disorder. Do you agree? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, that doesn't make sense to me uh, because you can't pr you can't separate out the two like that. And as a matter of fact, the treatment for a mood problem and an eating disorder is often quite the same. So, you know, the meds we use are the same. They're antidepressants. They're also anti-bulimics. The psychotherapies are related. CBT is the most effective treatment for depression. So it, it makes no sense to parcel them out and separate them that way. The area where it is more difficult is when you have a comorbid substance use problem. Then it is difficult to treat an eating disorder in the context of somebody who's a cocaine addict or an alcoholic. And, should be obvious to you why that is. Somebody who's, uh, you know, taking a drug like cocaine that affects appetite and weight and intake uh, is not going to be available psychologically, uh, nor be able to tolerate the weight gain that you need to if you're on an inpatient unit for anorexia. And the same thing with alcohol. So alcohol contains a lot of calories and it's really bad calories. So if you're trying to treat someone with anorexia how to eat healthily, you can't do that if they're imbibing every day, you know, 2,000 calories of alcohol. So when it comes to substance abuse, sometimes you kind of have to treat the substance abuse first before you can treat the eating disorder, but that's not true for anxiety or depression. Thank you for addressing that. And another question is, what is the best approach and education for an eating disorder patient in a short-term inpatient stay? Well, again, it depends what their eating disorder is. Mm -hmm. uh, there is very little rationale or reason to have to hospitalize somebody with bulimia nervosa. Right? People with bulimia nervosa can be treated as outpatients, as can people with binge eating disorder. There's, there's really no reason or justification for hospitalization other than cases I've seen where people have concurrent diabetes and they're manipulating their insulin to try and lose weight. But that creates all kinds of medical problems and sometimes medical crises that might require hospitalization. But other than that, one should be able to treat people with bulimia either in intensive outpatient programs, uh, day hospital type settings, but not requiring them to sleep overnight. It's different for anorexia because anorexia carries with it medical risk. And as people lower their rate, they become increasingly vulnerable to an acute medical event that could in fact be lethal. So there is a justification to hospitalize people with, with uh, anorexia nervosa and unfortunately short stays aren't that effective. You can't refeed somebody and a, in a healthy safe way and ask them to gain 30 pounds in two weeks. That, that's not a safe practice and it's not going to be very useful. So certainly you can stabilize people if they have medical problems. Let's say their potassium is low. Sure, you can, you can stabilize somebody overnight by giving them intravenous potassium uh, uh, or other abnormalities in their blood or cardiographic abnormalities. But that's not going to address the underlying eating disorder. It just addresses the medical complications. That can be done in a short stay unit. Great. Thank you so much. So we have time. Our, oh, I'm sorry, go so ahead. Our average length of stay, I think the best approach is you bring people with anorexia into the hospital and you begin to refeed them and you can get people's weight up to a reasonably level where they're medically stable probably within four to six weeks. And then they can be discharged to an intensive outpatient follow-up. Hard to do that in less than four weeks. Thank you so much. Um, so we have time for a couple more questions here. Um, one is from an attendee who is asking, as a parent, is it best not to mention exercise at all? We haven't focused on weight loss at all, haven't mentioned it. Should we continue to avoid that with our 18-year-old son who is now several states away at college? So just so I understand the question, the question is, should a parent encourage exercise in a child uh, who's healthy? Is that is that the question or I'm not sure what? I, I believe it's for a, a child with binge eating disorder. 
binge eating disorder. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So one of the problems with people with bed is they're sedentary, and that contributes to their obesity. And it's a real challenge to get people with bed to be active. Absolutely should be encouraging people with bed to exercise in a healthy way. Uh, again, different for anorexia. You're not going to encourage somebody with anorexia who's significantly underweight to exercise. That would, that would not be a good thing because the exercise is part of the illness behavior. Bulimia, typically some bulimics exercise too much and you'd have to teach them what a healthy exercise is. Some are quite sedentary and you'd have to encourage exercise there. So again, depends on the specific kind of eating disorder, but certainly somebody with bed should be encouraged to be active and to exercise in a healthy way. Thank you. And another question from a parent with a son who has bed. Um, she's wondering, uh, my son is on Ciprolex for anxiety. Do you recommend Concerta as he has symptoms of ADHD as well? So again, th this, uh, you know, I'm hesitant to make strong recommendations because the data from our study, the only data that's been published on Concerta, uh, and your physician would have to agree to, to prescribe it off-label, right? This drug has not been approved for the treatment of bed. If you're in the United States, you're better off going with Vyvanse because it has been approved. And there's more data to support its efficacy. So I think it's worth going to a primary care physician if you're a parent with a child or having the child go him or herself to the family doctor and especially with a history of ADHD and asking for a trial of Vyvanse because it is approved and most family doctors would feel comfortable prescribing a drug that has FDA approval and wouldn't be comfortable prescribing a drug off-label. Great, thank you. So our last question that we have time for today um, from our attendee is wondering, what is the best way as a parent to confront uh, the person with bed? And I think she's asking when they are in the act of overeating. She says, I'm concerned with the cycle of feeling bad that can encourage overeating, etc." So that's a tough issue to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one wants to focus uh, maybe less on the specifics, but more on issues of quality of life. So if your child specifically is obese, then you need to emphasize the health risks that are associated with being obese and how that's going to interfere with their quality of life. Uh, if you try just to kind of, you know, so sort of lock the refrigerator kind of approach, that's not going to be that helpful over the long term. Uh, and the individual knows, uh, you know, that that the binge eating may not be healthy to them, but if you can associate it long term with quality of life issues and self esteem issues, uh, it, it's sometimes more effective taking that approach. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Kaplan. Um, a lot of our attendees are expressing their gratitude to you. Um, we also have one eating disorder counselor in a private practice on Vancouver Island who wishes to thank you for this awesome presentation. Yeah, and I hope, it, I hope it's been helpful information for all of you. And good luck with your practices. Thank you. So thank you again, Dr. Kaplan, for this presentation. And thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar on binge eating disorder. If you happen to join us in the middle of the presentation, we will have a recording available on the Eating Disorder Hope website. And if you have any other questions, please send an email to info at eatingdisorderhope.com and we can direct your question at that point. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation and we would appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to review the recording as well. So on behalf of Eating Disorder Hope and our present, uh, presenter, Dr. Kaplan, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.